Hey everyone, this is Pastor Dane Johansson from Agros Reformed Baptist Church in Gilbert, Arizona. I just wanted to come to you today with a Bible that I would like to recommend um, for all you note takers out there. And I just think it's a um, quality Bible and a good Bible for study and one that I have benefited from and that I enjoy. It is the Newberry Reference Bible, uh, single column interleaved edition of the authorized version, also known as the King James, put out by Ritchie Publications. Um, this is the black calf skin. I'm pretty sure this is a calf split with a printed grain on it. Um, I think it's the Korean printing. It's got art gilt page edges, as you can see, and comes with two tassels. Um, not the best tassels I've ever encountered. And it's got beautiful head and tail bands, the black and gold. It is a extremely large Bible. As you can see, it's uh, very, very thick. Here's my hand. Um, it's uh, definitely a Bible you probably won't bring around, and even preachers and pastors might have a difficult time uh, lugging it into the pulpit, though I could see the benefit of using it, and I have even preached from it, I think, two or three times. <clears throat> you can see that beautiful gilding. They did a really good job on that, and the art gilding underneath the ink, the dye is pretty consistent as well. So I want to give a comparison just to, on the outside of how, how large this is. Um, if you are familiar with the Reformation Heritage KJV Study Bible, which is another uh, phenomenal Bible that I recommend. The black goatskin one is the one that I have right here in front of us. Um, here's an idea of the size, because this is a pretty sizable Bible. Um, if you can look at the size differences there, that is uh, really, really thick. I think this is probably, you know, two and a half inches, where this is probably closer to three and a half inches tall. Um, so it's going to be a big Bible. Um, it's definitely not light, even if you have it in your lap or your, or your hand. Um, it, it would get tiresome to carry around and, and use as your uh, daily Bible if you like to sit and read or carry it somewhere. It's probably more of a desk Bible, and that's kind of what I use it as, whereas, you know, this one, though it's big um, and a little bit heavier, um, no, it's about the same in, in weight, um, though it's still big and, and heavy. You can carry it around um, pretty easy, <clears throat> and I still do. A couple other examples you can compare it to if you guys have the Geneva Bible 1599 one put out by Tully Leahy Press. That's the size difference there of those two. So you can see just how how fat this one is. Um, looks like one of those, you know, older tomes that are sitting on somebody's bookcase somewhere that you'd find in a theological library. <clears throat> but it's, you know, it's kind of cool and attractive in that, that it's that, it's that big. It's just kind of uh, intimidating. And man, if you like to just, you know, toss your Bible down and kind of have the biggest Bible in the room, um, that's this is the one to get for sure. Um, here's the regular size, just the standard size, Newberry um, reference Bible. Uh, they are single column, and we'll look at the inside of the text in a minute. Um, so there's the the difference there. This obviously comes with some nicer tassels. At least they're they're longer, and uh, you can see the rounded spine on both of those. How it it curves in, um, which helps it to lay nice and flat so if you get the regular size one this is what you're going to be uh, dealing with versus the interleaved edition and i think the wide margin edition is the same size as this one maybe i think it's a larger footprint <clears throat> but these have the identical footprint um but you're going to see the difference in size where this is you know easy to carry around it's portable um it's doable this one's um kind of ridiculous in a lot of ways for how big it is but looking at the outside again it's a calf skin is how it's advertised but I'm pretty sure it's a calf split with a grain stamped on it kind of like how um, <clears throat> it reminds me of some of the older Cambridge calf skins and it also reminds me of uh, Trinitarian Bible Society's 
Caskian on the Windsor and some of the other editions. Um, the Westminster one is a nice Mariva calfskin, but I actually don't mind this. It's a it's a thick piece of leather. It's a nice thick cut of leather. Um, you can see the corner work there. It's it's not the best, but it's a it's a paste down, but it's still pretty flexible. And the thing is, you're not going to want some floppy Bible uh, for for just how large this thing is. Um, you're going to want something that has some, some substance to it, and yeah, I even wish that the spine was a little bit more reinforced. The spine tends to bend inward with the text, and that can kind of make it difficult to hold and read from and use uh, and carry. Because you have an example here with this, uh, another sizable Bible, um, and it is, you know, just absolutely luxurious in its cover, where it's goat skin and I think this is some kind of calf skin or a synthetic liner and let me just show you this when you open it up and hold it um, it just absolutely melts um, and that you can actually fold this thing completely over in half um, and that's usually how I read it if I have it in my lap or anything but this is kind of hard to hard to handle and um, it's not, it's not the best to have in the hand or on your lap. It'll just kind of spill over and makes it a little bit difficult to read. So my point in saying that is, you know, with bigger Bibles, it's kind of nice to have a, um, a firmer, uh, more sturdy cover just because it will um, support the weight of the text block. Um, so we've compared with, with those. And then lastly, here is the Cambridge Wide Margin Concord. KJV. So you're going to see that that's getting closer in size, but this is still, the new berry there on bottom is still way, way bigger. So, and the footprint obviously is going to be a little bit wider on the Cambridge. But anyway, this is uh, probably a Bible most people will have on their desks. It is a paste down liner. Again, that helps give some sturdiness to the cover. Um, uh, looks like they did a pretty good job with the hinge. Uh, I don't really have any complaints with the hinge. It's a little stiff when you first get it, but again, um, you're gonna want it to have some support. So anyway, there you go. Even just opening it lace flat there. Um, I did a pretty good job here. Um, putting the text in, getting it all nice and up so anyway here's the the title page by John Ritchie Christian Publications this is a 2018 printing and the ghosting is way worse on camera than in person it's really not that bad and it looks pretty atrocious from here so what's cool about this Bible <coughs> is the feature of the interleaved and then also if you're unfamiliar with the Newberry Bible the Newberry Bible is is really cool um, arranged so as to give, as far as possible, the accuracy, precision, and certainty of the original Hebrew and Greek languages on the page of the authorized version by means of simple and appropriate signs and with the divine titles distinguished and explained. Adapted for both the biblical student and for the ordinary reader of English. So if you're a pastor, this will be come in handy if you use it as you know your daily reader or study um, uh, especially if you're not as fluent in the biblical languages. Um, but even if you are, you know, my, my Greek is, is good and my Hebrew is okay. Um, so this has helped me even in my Hebrew. Um, but you know, even in the Greek where, you know, I'm, I'm pretty decent in the Greek and can read from it without much issue. Um, this has been helpful. So anyway, it has, you know, here's some of the information. There's the ISBN if you want to look at that and pause and get it. Some more information there about Ritchie Publications and John Ritchie. And then it has a biographical introduction of Thomas Newberry himself. Again, the ghosting looks absolutely atrocious on the camera, but it's uh, it's really not that bad. It's, a, it's I mean, it's not great, but it's not that bad. So anyway, there's a little biographical introduction with him. And goes through. And then you have the contents page. And 
and you see the the text kind of pulling on its own that's because it's uh, actually has overcast stitching so it's a smite zone binding and then it has some overcast so here you have the introduction where this is going to explain all of the the symbols and notes that you're going to have throughout the um, throughout the authorized version text so this is basically if you, if you master this this system which I'm still figuring out how to do um, you're going to be able to see the underlying languages of, of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek um, displayed in the English itself. And I'll show you um, <clears throat> how it's translated and the underlying, you know, it, sometimes it's, it's just one word in Hebrew and Greek and it's broken up into four or five or six words in English. Um, so it'll, it'll show you, you know, even if you're not fluent in Greek and Hebrew, or if you're if you're pretty good and you're a pastor who studied it, a minister who has studied it, it'll still help you, um, you know, not have to flip open and do a lot of parsing and stuff. You'll just have it right there on the page. So anyway, it goes through. Obviously, the introduction to the Old Testament is going to talk about Hebrew, and the introduction to the New Testament will talk about Greek. <laughs> so it has all these unique symbols that we'll see in the text for determining um, just what the underlying Greek and Hebrew say. So there's a lot of really good information in here. It talks about synonyms and things like that. And then there's kind of an explanation. Here's, here's a brief explanation of signs right there on page um, 14 of the preface. So it'll give you a good guide. And then here's a... Uh, a chart of grammar for Greek and Hebrew. And then you have right here, first steps in Hebrew grammar. So it's gonna tell you how to pronounce the alphabet, talk about the vowel points, how to pronounce them. It's just gonna give you a, a pretty easy overview of basic Hebrew grammar. You have some paradigms there, different lists, conjugations, verb forms, paradigms, and then weights and measures. Go into that, and then we have right here in the text. So, right here, obviously, lays flat enough, um, even like this, lays flat enough to write and read in it. Probably best, you know, when you're just reading at first to. Um, have it open like this to read. And then when you're taking your notes, you can either put a book of the same size underneath to hold it up, or you can just move it flat and write in it like that, which I have done. <clears throat> so here's the text. It's actually really nice laid out. I know some people don't like the, the old style uh, typesetting and font. I actually love it. Um, it's always been one of my favorites and you know back when I used modern versions that was always something that um, um, I wish I could have could have had in those versions um, that the KJV technically or, or typically usually had so navigating it's going to be in Roman numerals on the heading rather than in Arabic numerals like that we technically use so it'll be in Roman numerals the Latin uh, way of looking at the, so you're gonna have to learn how to get familiar with that. But that's a good habit too. That's a good skill to have anyway, because a lot of older works use that. <clears throat> so it's good to know how to read that. But anyway, you can see the text there. It'll have, you know, emphasized words. It has, uh, see all those little symbols there. Every little symbol, <clears throat> that one means that it's plural. So the word Elohim for God is actually in a plural. The im ending is uh, makes it plural. So it shows you plurals that are not reflected in the translation and the underlying Hebrew and Greek are plural. All these little symbols um, mean something as far as grammar um, and learning how to use it will help. It has some cross references in the left-hand margin along with key Hebrew words or Greek in the New Testament and then the, their translation over here. So some alternative translations. And the paper on this this Bible, um, I really, really like. I would probably say it's a, it's 
something like a 30, 31, 32 GSM. Um, I think it was printed in Korea, but um, they, they still chose really nice paper and did a good job with the binding. Here's my notes. I use a Pigma Micron pen that a lot of us use in the nerdy Bible community for note taking notes and stuff. And again, you know, you're not seeing any bleed through, you're seeing some show through for the notes um, that I've taken, but this paper takes really good notes. It holds ink well. And so, again, one of the selling points of this and what makes it such a large Bible is that every single page of Bible text has a corresponding page that's blank that you can write on. I think this is the only page in the whole in the whole thing that came with a printed anything on it. The rest of it's all just blank. And this one also has a margin, whereas the rest of them don't have a margin kind of framing it. So anyway, um, <clears throat> you know, some people have the problem of when they write, the text goes that way. Sometimes I have that. Um, but I think actually being able to have the show through a little bit, and again, which is worse um, on camera than it is in real life, um, actually helps because you can kind of follow the underlying text to keep it straight. <clears throat> but yeah, there's, you know, a few other places that I've done that. Um, taken notes. So you can see that art gilding is, is really, really nice. It's really uniform and, and consistent and deep, dark, kind of like an Allen. Not the salmon color, more of a dark pink. Here's some notes I've taken in Joshua as well. But it, it lays it lays nice and flat. Let me show you the overcasting here in the um, just because I've already passed the middle and I wanted to get to the New Testament anyway. Here's Matthew, and then I'll show you the introduction to the New Testament. Oh, this also has, you know, some of the signs employed that you can master really quickly. And it goes into the New Testament. I'll give you an overview of signs employed, um, some of the grammar of Greek for a quick reference and seeing how differences in Hebrew or Hebrew and Greek and Greek and English are done. Here's a cool little diagram of, <coughs> of uh, prepositions in Greek. Um, those are always cool to have. synonyms, divine titles. Oh, and this is cool. It has a uh, textual criticism, talks about textual criticism. And this actually has, as we'll see, a uh, critical apparatus at the bottom of the page in the New Testament. So again, reflecting the English. Uh, and this is obviously a little dated, but um, one thing you realize when you study text criticism is all the variants that they were talking about in the late 1800s are still the variants they're talking about now in the manuscripts. Obviously, there's some more information, but it's uh, still all basically talking about the same stuff. And the discoveries that were done in the 1800s are still relevant. So here you go. You've got your critical readings here at the bottom. Obviously, some are going to have more. You've got your Greek on one side, translation. Here's one where you're seeing more uh, critical apparatus stuff. Let me get here, I'll show you the... They've got a few little things in between, talking about Paul, that were added after Newberry, so that this edition put in because Newberry was a dispensationalist, and um, I'm pretty sure the publishers also are sympathetic to dispensationalism. But um, you know, none of his theology comes out in the text itself. Um, that's not going to bother anyone. I'm a confessional Reformed Baptist, and obviously I'm not uh, sympathetic in the least 
to dispensationalism yet. Um, you know, I use this Bible and I don't find any issues with it. This section that talks about Paul's life and ministry, but um, I'm having trouble finding it, so it's not a big deal. Here's where I'm working in First Peter. Obviously, it lays still nice and flat all the way throughout. Um, and again, you can kind of prop it up and use it that way. Or you need to lay it down. You get to where you can see the overcasting. Here's the overcasting. You can see that there. So this is in the beginning and the end. It will not only be smithstone, but have some overcasting to help with the construction of the Bible and durability. And at the end, the only complaint I have is, okay, so here's Revelation 22, and it's the last page, and you turn it, and you have your text, oh, but you don't have a blank page. Um, but at the end here, they have some, and so you can kind of see where the binding, just because it's so heavy and they don't have much support on the spine or anything, is splitting. But the thing is, if I lose all these dispensational maps in the back uh, and <laughs> dispensational charts, uh, I am not going to have any issue with that. Um, so because there's no blank page here, I might uh, tape in a blank page to take notes, um, or maybe just try to fit him here and here. I mean, he's got some dispensational stuff here in the back. Obviously not dispensationalist, but it doesn't bother me. But anyway, there it is. Um, though it's a printed grain, it looks really nice, and it feels really good. Um, the hinges are nice. So anyway, yeah, guys, that's the Newberry Reference Bible. Single column interleaved authorized version um, really good tool even if you know you don't use the authorized version as your main bible um, or um, you know you don't know greek and hebrew this is still going to be a very very good um, tool to use so anyway guys uh, may the lord bless you and keep you god bless